The broadcast you are about to hear is scientific fiction. Action 80. Attention, Sen Clan 1, Headquarters, Defense Command, Washington. Commander Mark T. Richards, USN, reporting. Address C, Action 80. Subject, Project Sailfish, Code 7, Classification, Top Secret. Following is brought to your immediate attention. This is urgent. Repeat, this is urgent. This is Dan Coverley. Stay tuned now as we take you to a naval base somewhere in the United States for a report on the first atomic submarine. Naval Commander Mark T. Richards reporting. Pursuant to Buper's orders dated 1 April 1952, I was detached from temporary duty with Naval Defense Command, Washington, and reported to Andrews Field for immediate transportation to New Haven, Connecticut. From there, I was directed to proceed without delay to Naval Base Charlie, where I was to report to Admiral R.L. Carruthers, commanding. In accordance with the above, I was assigned transportation aboard military air transport plane C-868, Andrews Field. At 1300 hours, 1 April 1952, said aircraft departed Andrews Field. After routine flights, the transport landed at New Haven, Connecticut, time 1642. I reported to the transportation officer and received a driver in the jeep. At 1815, I arrived and reported with orders to the office of Admiral Carruthers. Richards? Yes, sir. Reporting for duty, sir. Please sit down. Thank you, sir. Cigar? No, thank you, Admiral. Mm. Imported Havana. Nice aroma, don't you think? Yes, sir. Very nice, sir. <clears throat> Commander Richards, what do you know about Project Sailfish? Atomic submarine, sir. Authorized by the Secretary of Defense. Begun May 1949. Designated Experimental Vessel X-915. Cost about uh, $50 million. What about the timetable? And I believe the first atomic sub is scheduled for test runs next year. I see you've been reading the newspapers. <laughs> and the file in the bureau, sir. Suppose I told you both new ships and the daily papers are wrong. Since this base was activated, Commander, world conditions have changed. The Navy's no longer satisfied with the eight-hour day, the 40-hour week. For this reason, we have been on a round-the-clock basis for almost six months. Project Sailfish is one year ahead of schedule. It deserves a whistle. If we could publicly display our accomplishments, the fact is we can't. Not even to the Bureau of Ships, sir? Not even to Congress. Oh, I'm beginning to understand why my orders were classified top secret. Commander, there are 307 men working on this base. Every single one of these men has been given the most thorough loyalty check possible. Every single one of them has been working and living behind barbed wire for the past six months. But you suspect a leak, sir? We're not sure. Two days ago, a convoy arrived at the base. Eight trucks. In one of those trucks was the Steinberg Periscope. I've heard of it, sir. But not more than a handful have. Yet, when the periscope was being installed yesterday aboard the X-915, it fell to the deck, made completely inoperative. Inoperative? But how in the, the world... The cable on the crane lifting it into place snapped. Steel cable. Had it been cut, sir? It had not. In fact, the lab technicians assured me it simply broke under the strain. Well, if the lab... Just said... a moment. That cable was designed to support 100 tons. The Steinberg periscope weighs less than 20. Well, yet the cable broke from strains. Sir. All right, Commander. There are two possibilities. One, that the cable was faulty to begin with. A manufacturer's mistake. I'm having Washington check that for me now. The second, that someone on this base somehow weakened that cable. Sabotage. Exactly. Commander, only one thing matters to me right now, that the X-915 completes her first trial run. They must proceed according to plan, without interruption. That's why I filed my report to Action 80. Yes, sir. I'll help in any way I can, sir. Uh, when do you plan to test the sub? Sometime this month? Not this month, Commander. Tomorrow. Twenty-one hundred hours, Tuesday, 1 April. After leaving Admiral Carruthers' office, I checked into the BOQ. I had dinner at the officer's mess and then looked up Lieutenant Commander Stanley Linden, Chief Engineering Officer on the base. Admiral Carruthers had suggested I talk to him. At his quarters, I was told Linden was at the docks, working. Naval Base Charlie was surrounded by barbed wire, yet within the base itself was still a smaller area, surrounded by more barbed wire, patrolled by armed sailors every ten yards. 
I found the inner gate and presented the special yellow pass handed to me by the Admiral. Even with the high-priority yellow, I was given the same checkout received by any other visitor to this inner barbed wire area. For here it was, behind the wire, behind the wire, that the United States ship X-915 was moored. The first atomic submarine. Floodlights covered the area and brought a glaring whiteness over the faces of the men working. But that wasn't what caught my eye. It was the thing that lay alongside the dock, the iron and steel monster that nestled against the pier like a giant pig. And the men swarming over her decks were like her brood come to eat. Here she was, black, hideous, beautiful. The X-915, 5,000 tons, $50 $50 million. The Navy's first line of defense in any future war. The atomic age. Gone down to the sea in ships. I found Lieutenant Commander Stanley London standing just outside a six-by-six six wooden shack near the docks. We shook hands. He invited me inside. Admiral Carruthers phoned you were coming down, Commander. What's the story, London, about the uh, Steinberg periscope? What's the story? I wish you could tell me. Well, how do you feel about it, personally? Me? Yes, you, not official Navy. Sabotage. I see. Don't ask me why I feel that way or what tells me something has gone wrong around here. But something has. More than just the periscope? Oh, a lot more. Something else has happened, Commander, to the men, the crew, the officers. Is it the speed up? Well, it could be. 24-hour days, seven-day weeks. Even with three shifts, you get the feeling of rush, of hurry. Get it done right now. Get it done yesterday. You're a crane operator. You think he had something to do with it? Thompson? No. Then I could say that about almost every man on the base. They were hand-picked, Commander. Not just stray workmen with know-how, but the best. Nobody applied for a job here, not even me. We were all chosen. And the loss of your periscope doesn't postpone your trial run for tomorrow? Oh, no. Washington didn't take chances with anything on Project Sailfish. Not one, but two Steinberg periscopes were made. The second was installed less than an hour ago. (laughs) Action 80. I beg your pardon, Commander. Basic principle of Action 80, Lyndon. Don't be certain, be twice certain. Hmm. Commander, just who is Action 80? I've noticed every order out of this base lists them as an addressee. Action 80 was born out of the unification program, Lyndon. In charge of all experimental development, Navy, Marine, Air Force, Army, even some civilian experiments. Wherever there's a major project developing, you'll find Action 80 behind it. Kind of a board of directors overseeing tomorrow? Yes, except that tomorrow is usually here today. Uh, You remember the B-29, Lyndon? Action 80 was the force behind it. The same was true with radar, jet aircraft, atomic energy. Not so futuristic at that, huh, Lyndon? Mm-hmm. And Action 80 is simply the code designation. Right. Ah. What's your ETD for tomorrow, London? Estimated time of departure, 700, 0, 700, that is. Good. Well, Commander, are you... When the X-915 makes her first trial run at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, London, I'm going to be aboard. Good night. Zero six five zero hours. Wednesday, 2 April, 1952. Captain Z.L. Unger, USN commanding officer, set special sea detail aboard the USS X-915. At 0700, the X-915 was underway. Lieutenant Commander Linden and myself stood on the bridge beside Captain Unger. And as the veteran captain gave his orders to the engine room, could see the veins in his neck pulsating. The first atomic sub was underway. 0830. The X-915 was in the open sea. Lyndon and I were below decks. Those engines sound good. Yes. What's our speed, Lyndon? 30 knots. Traveling at two-thirds. Cruise at 50? Well, that's what the book says. 50 knots. 45 knots submerged. Ah, been reading the same book, Commander. (laughs) Today's test is speed and maneuverability. Test able. Right? Right. Tomorrow we go for depth, if we make it today. 
ten hundred hours. Captain Unger gave the command to standard speed. The X-915 responded softly and efficiently and made fifty knots. Eleven hundred hours. Captain Unger gave the command to flank speed. And we made good sixty knots. Nothing in the United States Navy could catch her. Twelve hundred hours. Speed set at standard. And now the technicians took over, an even dozen swarming over everything mechanical and electronic, giving the X-915 macroscopic scrutiny, checking against charts, checking against gauges, checking against... sabotage? At 1,700 hours, the exercises were secured. At 1,730, the X-915 tied up alongside the dock at Naval Base Charlie. The pig boat of tomorrow was everything the Navy had hoped for, and then some. The pig boat of tomorrow was here to stay. Lyndon and I went to the BOQ, changed clothes, and joined Admiral Carruthers for dinner in his office. Lyndon reported, and I listened. If there was sabotage aboard the atomic sub that had kept itself well hidden, everybody was pleased. I decided to continue my investigations on shore the next day, instead of joining Test Run Baker at 0700. Lyndon and I bid the Admiral good night and headed for our quarters. <laughs> 0700, Thursday, 3 April, 1952. The USS X-915 underway for depth tests. 0800. I began an investigation of the dock area. 0930. I was summoned to the office of Admiral Carruthers. The messenger said it was urgent. Never mind that. Put me through to Washington at once. That's right. At once. Come in, Commander Richards. Hello, Washington. Get me the Secretary of Defense. I don't care where he is now. Get him. All right, all right. Call me back right away. Commander. Yes, sir. There are some charts on that table over there. Get them. I want them on my desk. Yes, sir. What? He's in a meeting. What the dickens do I care if he's in a meeting? No, I don't care if he's with the president. Get him. Right. Here are your charts, sir. Good. You know the test area for today's trials, Richard. Circle them. Yes, sir. I, uh, believe this covers area stork, Admiral. Sorry to keep you in suspense this week, Commander, but I haven't had time to explain. What? You got him. Oh, good. Hello. Hello? Yes, this is Carruthers. Yes, sir. Yes, that, that's right. No, nothing's changed. No, sir. I want authority to put Plan Zebra in effect at once. Yes, at once. Good. Thank you. Yes, right away. All right, Commander Richards, this is it. The X-915 began depth maneuvers at 0800. They would remain at various depths until 0900. It is now 940. The X-915 has not surfaced. But what about radio contacts, sir? Silence. They have not answered a radio message since 845. Then they're in trouble. No, Commander, I do not think the atomic sub is in trouble. But surely if they haven't answered radio calls... That sub was equipped with any number of special emergency devices, including an automatic marker which would immediately rise to the surface should any trouble develop with the engine. No markers have appeared, sir? Furthermore, if she were on the bottom, her captain had only to press a key to discharge a large boy. Then if she isn't in trouble, there's only one conclusion. The X-915 is deliberately remaining silent and is proceeding under her own orders to some unknown destination. And her destroyer escorts have lost contact with her? The accompanying destroyers report the sub disappeared off their sonar screen at full submerged speed. Forty-five knots. No destroyer in our fleet could catch her, even if we knew where she was heading. Commander Richards, there is only one possible conclusion. The X-915 has fallen into enemy hands. Ten hundred hours, 3 April 1952. Admiral Carruthers' office. Amidst the deluge of telephone calls, teletypes, and clattering decoding machines, the Admiral explains Plan Zebra. Fifteen plans were evolved covering each phase of the trial runs of Project Sailfish. Each plan covered a particular contingency. Of all 15, Plan Zebra was to be used only in the case of extreme emergency. Yes, sir. In brief, Plan Zebra covered the possibility of capture of the X-915 by alien forces. You see, Commander Richards, even though such an occurrence as this was unlikely in the extreme, every possible mishap in this operation had to be provided for. And the Secretary gave you permission to put this plan into effect, sir? Roger. Within half an hour, a task force will steam out of three separate bases on the Atlantic coast. They will rendezvous at this point. Here, on the chart. That's about 100 miles southeast of this base. Right. 
When the task force is rendezvoused, they will then begin Search Able, which is the second step in Plan Zebra. To find the X-915. Not to find the X-915, Commander Richards. To sink her. Eleven hundred hours. Still no word from the X-915. Destroyers escorting the atomic sub on her second trial run had watched her dive and had never regained either visual, radar, or sonar contact. The ferrometers aboard the destroyers supported the Admiral's theory that the X-915 was not on bottom. Again, only one conclusion remained. The atomic sub was proceeding to destination unknown under her own orders. Either the crew was composed entirely of traitors, which was unlikely in view of the exhaustive loyalty checks made on them, or some small portion of that crew... Perhaps but a handful of men had succeeded in taking over command of the vessel. With the sub maintaining complete radio silence, this latter point could only be guessed. 1130 hours. Admiral Carruthers established radio contact with the task force, which had now begun to rendezvous at Point Stork. The task force commander, Captain Stevens, was designated by the code name Red Dog One for radio communications. Admiral Carruthers was using Pier Point Five. This is Red Dog One. This is Red Dog 1. Hello, Pier Point 5. Hello, Pier Point 5. This is Red Dog 1. How do you read me? Over. Hello, Red Dog 1. This is Pier Point 5. I read you 5 by 5. Pier Point 5. This is Red Dog 1. Group has met at Point Stark. Over. Red Dog 1 from Pier Point 5. Execute search plan able. Good luck. Over. Pier Point 5. Thanks, Skipper. Over and out. Captain Stevens is a good man, Commander. If anyone can catch them... He can. The sub has a pretty fair lead, Admiral. We haven't got anything in the fleet that can make good 45 knots submerged. I don't know who is commanding the X-915 right now, Richards. But if he's smart, he isn't traveling submerged. I don't understand your point, sir. What about our air search? They'd spot him in a minute if he surfaced. The sub is equipped with Mark 10 radar. That means they can pick up a plane or an Air Force group 100 miles away. By traveling on the surface, he can make good 60 knots. He'll have plenty of time to die before being spotted by the Air Force. And at 60 knots, we haven't the slightest chance of... I'm afraid you're right, Commander. Yes? Oh, yes, just a minute. Commander, it's for you. You take it in the other office, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Richard speaking. Commander Richard, sir. Yes, who is it? Sir, this is the sentry down at the torpedo shack. Yes, go on. Well, sir, you remember when you were down here this morning about 9 o'clock? You told us to leave, you know, if anything funny happened. All right, sentry, what have you found? Well, well sir, Commander, that's just it. We didn't find nothing. One of them torpedo cases came open just a little while ago, and we seen they were empty. Somebody had taken them atomic warheads out of them during the night. All right, get ten men. Uh, no, no, make it twenty. Search the entire storeroom. Search the base. Check back with me in thirty minutes. No, no, we haven't got time for that now. And see why that second fighter group hasn't contacted our task force yet. Right. Oh, it's you, Commander. You try. You've got to try. Even when you know you can't possibly win. Admiral... I've got an idea. Idea? I hope it contains a miracle. It contains a thousand to one shot. I'd say that's about a million to one better than our chances right now. What is your idea, Commander? I received a phone call just now. That phone call was from the sentry down at the torpedo shack. Admiral, he told me he found the atomic warhead crates empty. Empty? They're conducting a thorough search, but I don't imagine they'll find them. Commander Richard, do you realize the gravity of your remarks? Those crates were marked torpedoes, but you know as well as I do what they actually contain. Yes, sir. They contained atomic warheads for the rockets aboard the X-915. They were scheduled for use on the final trial run. Equipped with those warheads, that sub could launch a full-scale atomic attack on any city on the eastern seaboard. Exactly my reasoning, sir. Then what makes you so darn pleased about it? Not only has an enemy force succeeded in capturing our first atomic submarine, we now learn they have taken along the greatest single weapon the United States Navy owns and could thus demolish any city on the eastern seaboard. Sir. Well, Commander Richards, you, you darn well better explain yourself. Admiral, the captors of the X-915 pulled off one of the greatest coups in military history. Wouldn't you think they'd be satisfied to let it go at that? Please continue, Commander. However, this enemy went to the added risk of stealing a shipment of atomic launching rockets. Now, why? Why? Why take that extra gamble unless they had plans to use it? I'm beginning to see your point, Commander. If the captains of the X-915 merely wanted to sub and were planning to make a run for it, they'd have accomplished it. But they included in their plans our atomic rockets. Admiral Carruthers, it's my guess they're going to use those rockets in the near future. Say, today. I'll go along with that reasoning, Commander. Let's get to work. 
1,300 hours, 3 April 1952. Admiral Carruthers and I studied the charts of the Atlantic coast. We agreed the logical target for atomic attack would be the city of New York. Figuring the effective range of the sub's atomic rockets at 100 miles, we then sketched in the launching area the sub would have to use. Once that was established, there remained one simple detail. Stop those rockets from ever leaving the sub's deck. Admiral Carruthers, lately of Inuitok, Iwo Jima truck in the Philippines, had a plan. All right, Commander, we've settled on the site of their attack. That becomes our bullseye. Around that bullseye, we draw a circle ten miles out, like this. Then, another circle, another ten miles. And still another, until the outer circle around the bullseye measures 100-mile radius. In other words, sir, our outer circle is out of the atomic sub's radar range. Exactly. Now, calculating their speed and course, they should arrive at point bullseye, the center, just about the time we're able to complete a ring of ships 100 miles out. With the X-915 in the center, except if we close in, sir, the sub will submerge and escape under us. We won't close in. I beg your pardon, sir? We'll send one ship in toward the bullseye, alone. The sub will pick up contact. Yes, I'm beginning to understand. They'll figure it for a stray vessel, not enough of a threat to frighten them. But it would force them to shift their position before launching their rockets. Right. And it also forces them to travel submerged. That negates their 100-mile radar. Next, we send in another lone ship. Sub ships position again to another segment of our circle. Then we send in still another ship. We're constantly narrowing their corridor for attack. And when they break surface in the last remaining segment to fire their rockets... We're surrounding them. We hope to God we are, Commander. Hello, Red Dog 1. Hello, Red Dog 1. This is Pier Point 5. Over. Hello, Pier Point 5. This is Red Dog 1. Over. Discontinue search plan able. I repeat, discontinue search plan able. Over. Uh, Pier Point 5, this is Red Dog 1. Uh, would you repeat your last transmission? Over. Red Dog 1, this is Pier Point 5. I repeat, discontinue your present search plan. The following plan supersedes all previous orders. It is to be executed immediately following this transmission. I repeat... The, the Admiral, with the patience of a man who knew his job, began dictating to his task force commander the base search pattern they were to follow. For five minutes, he gave facts and figures that he explained the purpose of this new plan. If his conversation was terse to the point of being salty, then it was still more temperate than the situation might have called for. By 1600, the plan was in effect. The Admiral clicked off his radio transmitter and we stared at each other. We had to pray for one thing. That whoever had captured the X-915 would now proceed to the launching area. And once there, attempt to destroy the city of New York. Seventeen fifteen. The sun was low outside the Admiral's office. The sun was low outside the city of New York. Sundown was made for submarines. It is their witching hour, their debut, their time for attack. Coffee, Commander? Thank you, sir. What time is it? Uh, 5.20, sir. Beautiful sunset. Yes, sir. Used to seem like this off in a wee talk. Pacific. That's where you have the sunsets. Linden served in the Pacific, sir. Linden? Linden? Oh. More coffee, Admiral? Commander, what happened to Chief Engineer Linden? Uh, Captain Unger. Unger was a classmate of mine at the Academy. He didn't sell out. None of them sold out, sir. They were Shanghai. You can bet on it. And they're all aboard that sub right now. Linden and Unger and a lot of good men. The sub, it's our job to sink. Pier point five, this is Red Dog One. Come in, please. Oh, that's Captain Stevens. They should be at the launching point now. Pier point five to Red Dog One. Go ahead. Over. Pier point five, we have completed the ring. I repeat, we have completed the ring. Over. Red Dog One, Pier point five. Have you sent in your first messenger? Pier point five, Red Dog One. Roger. Hold on. Red Dog One, proceed with plan. Please advise any contact. Over and out. The Admiral sat down behind his chart-cluttered desk, the wind-lined stains of his face more noticeable now, and together we waited. Pier point five, and sending in second messenger, ring closing. No contact as yet. Over and out. Together we waited ten minutes, twenty minutes, thirty minutes. Sending in third messenger, closing to a bullseye, 
No contact. Over and out. One by one, the single ships were slicing across the big target we'd drawn on our chart. Each ship slicing in closer toward the launching area, forcing the enemy we'd never seen to change plans, change positions, yet not frightening him enough to make him forget his attack. Clear point five, Red Dog one. Sending in seventh messenger. No contact as yet. Closing within one zero miles of bullseye. I repeat, no contact. In one way, that's good, Commander. At least we can feel certain the X-915 hasn't surfaced. Well, we're safe from a radar, then. The sound range is 10,000 yards. And I'm going to order the task force to patrol that range. Red Dog 1, take position five miles from Bullseye. I repeat, take position five miles from Bullseye. Over. Fear point five, this is Red Dog 1. Okay, Skipper, but that's as close as we can get if we miss. Gal, darn it, we aren't going to miss. Close in. Aye, aye, sir. And report to me every minute. Yes, sir, we're closing in. Over and out. Stevens is worried. I don't blame him, sir. He's only worried. I'm scared. Suppose the sub headed for Siberia. Then we're out of luck anyway. Fear point five, closing to 10,000 yards. No contact. Destroyer group... Fear point five. Destroyer group off by Fort Bow has sighted enemy. I repeat, destroyer group has sighted enemy. The sub is surfacing. Fear point five, do you hear me? Over. Red Dog One, I hear you. Over. Enemy has surfaced. Destroyer group opening fire. Dive bombers coming in. Bombers making attack. Another two surfaced. Fear point five. Fear point five. Red Dog One. Red Dog One, come in, please. Red Dog One, this is Fear Point Five. Come in, please. Red Dog One, are you receiving me? Fear Point Five, this is Red Dog One. I am receiving you. Air Force and destroyer groups have attacked. The X-915 is sinking. I repeat, X-915 is sinking. Proceeding to pick up survivors. Over. Red Dog One. This is Pier Point Five. I... Well done. Over and out. Ten hundred hours, four April, nineteen fifty-two. Task Force Able reported into Admiral Carruthers. Seamen with brilliant naval records. All eight had been living and working within naval base Charlie for six months. And what of the Steinberg periscope? Why had they sabotaged it? The answer was, they had not. Just as the lab technicians told us, the cable had broken from strain. A manufacturer's mistake. A mistake that brought Action 80 onto the scene. A mistake that may have saved the city of New York. And in his excitement, Admiral Carruthers handed me a cigar. End of report, transmitted once to Action 80. The broadcast you have just heard was scientific fiction. Any similarity to persons living or dead was purely coincidental. Next week, Action 80 will bring you the top secret report of Dr. Robert Blackstone, noted astronomer, when radar contact is established with the moon. Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Conrad, Ed Begley, and Larry Dobkin. Music composed and recorded by Lee Stevens. Dan Coverley speaking. <laughs> <laughs> 